I'm Tim Ventura, and we're joined today by Brian Wang, co-founder and futurist thought leader, prominent science blogger whose platform nextbigfuture.com boasts over 1 million monthly readers and is ranked as the number one science news blog. His blog has over 30,000 articles written by Brian covering disruptive technologies and trends ranging from space, robotics, AI, self-driving cars, global electrification, medicine, anti-aging biotech, and nanotech. Brian has given annual updates on nanotech at Singularity University, advised laser nuclear fusion company HB11 Energy, and worked with Airbus Ventures on their portfolio of space and satellite companies. One of Brian's space designs is on the comprehensive internet source of space propulsion concepts, and it's about the Verne gun. Brian is a board member of Monty Jade West and gives quarterly talks to Asian and Asian American business professionals, executives, and entrepreneurs on topics like AI and humanoid robotics. He's invested in startups as an angel investor and helps with tech fundraising and also wrote part of the SpaceX investment guide. So Brian, welcome, sir. It is truly a pleasure to have you with me today. Great to join you, Tim. So you are engaged with a number of visionary science and tech projects. But again, I think people are most familiar with your website at nextbigfuture.com, which covers a ton of cutting edge research into areas like AI, robotics, fusion energy, space, so much more. All the stuff that we covered in the intro and, and much, much more. And even some geopolitical analysis. I've seen that up there lately. So let me start with the site. What can you tell us about nextbigfuture.com? How has the site grown and evolved over time? So it's always been my passion to analyze the future and science and technology. So it's something that I've done even as um, a child, high school, um, university. I won a second place in a futurist um, essay contest for Honeywell. So I just always loved it. And the site is, is where I put all that information and research that I would do anyway to, to do that. And what's changed over time is that things that I was writing about early on, 15, 20 years ago, are now coming to pass. You know, AGI is coming to pass, reusable rockets, uh, space development, every, you know, human robots, self-driving cars, it's all happening now. Yeah, there there is so much, so much. And we were talking earlier, you know, before recording about like, like my so my interest in terms of Kurzweil and the singularity and all that and for me it's just mind-blowing to see all of that stuff starting to come to fruition um so your own background includes an incredible diversity of interest areas as the site reflects and as I mentioned in the intro you've spoken on nanotech at singularity university advised a fusion energy company worked with Airbus on satellite tech how have you been able to develop the, the knowledge as well as the reputation of expertise and the professional network to be able to speak effectively and work with leaders across these diverse areas? I think that the 30,000 plus articles I've written basically gives me like a due diligence level knowledge of what's going on. Um, something that Sam Altman talked about recently was that he had a technology map um, in his head of all of the the frontiers of science and technology. And basically I I feel I have that as well. He got it because he was funding you know hundreds of companies and then he would probably see 10 times more pitches and stuff like that. So then you could get the the bleeding edge of all the science and technology and the best ideas from all the people. But I can do that as well by reading Every NASA NIAC, um, NASA Advanced Innovation Concept um, project, trying to talk to some of the researchers, looking at every DARPA project and every Air Force research project, as well as other developments in the with tech companies like Sam Altman's OpenAI, Elon Musk with Tesla, something like that. So by being able to constantly look at these developments, then I can synthesize uh, what's going on. Also go dig deep into looking and trying to understand um, research articles and papers on relevant uh, topics. So just the constant effort of basically like 30,000 plus articles, 30,000, 40,000 hours of work over many years. Yeah. It's like a 10,000 uh, hour 
you know, becoming an expert thing is that by constantly focusing on that, I think I've developed um, this broader, um, deep, not to the pure expert level on some things, but, you know, um, understanding what's being done. Well, that makes complete sense. It is so much due diligence and research and, you know, just working things out. So one of the areas that I want to get into is space. I know this is a giant passion area for you. And one of the things that you've been talking about is SpaceX and mass produced Starship rockets that may drive the cost down to five to 10 million per rocket with payload costs at $10 a kilo to orbit or $2 a kilo around the earth. You've estimated that this cost reduction would let Starlink take over 30% of the global communications market and would actually help Starship compete first in long-range air cargo and later in passenger air travel markets. So this is a big, brilliant concept. I'm wondering if you can kind of explain this a little bit more for us. So um, several points on this is that one, SpaceX already dominates space. For people who don't know, they have about 80% of the payloads going into orbit. They launched nearly 100 times last year. They're going to launch about 150 times this year versus other companies down at like 10, or even cold countries down at a lower level. Only China with mass launches can get up to around 60 years, something like that. So the level that SpaceX is at already is a huge level. For the for the rocket, and they reuse the the bottom stage, the Falcon Nine booster stage, about twenty times already for several other boosters. When I worked out the costs on that, the you're reusing seventy percent of the rocket from the first stage, and using about ten percent by reusing the pharynx, the the top part of the rocket. Mm. So just working that out, Tesla, uh, SpaceX's costs on rocket launch are probably in the $10 million per launch range. They're not charging that because there's no competition for them. So, and the other thing is, so that's on the rocket side. So then when the SpaceX Starship gets going, the main cost driver on that is the engines. So the Raptor engine is below a million dollars a piece. It's probably at half a million dollars and they're looking to get it to $250,000. Comparing that to the, RL-29, the, the, the basically the old um, uh, space shuttle engine that they're mm -hmm. reusing for SLS. Each one of those engines costs $100 million. Okay, so we're already at 100 times cheaper, and we could get to 400 times cheaper than other rocket engine, and the power of the Raptor is comparable to the space shuttle engine, right? So the 33 engines of the... Um, uh, Starship, super heavy, will get to it's uh, nearly three times the power of the Apollo rocket, and it's more powerful than the SLS engine. So, so that's just on the, on the engine side of things. But the overall cost that we discussed is that 33 engines at a quarter million dollar piece, that's $8 million. Six engines on the upper stage a quarter, at a quarter million dollar piece, that's $1.5 million double up the cost for steel, labor, and other things. And the, the other costs, overhead costs, can be reduced if you increase the volume of the of how many things you're making, how many rockets you're making each year. Um, so then, so that gets us to that, you know, five to $10 million range, right? If we can get the cost of the engines down, get the cost of the components down, then you're getting down to $10 million for the, 39 engines for the booster plus all the the steel and this, but then compare that to a airbus 380 at 300 million dollars 400 million dollars a, a boeing 77 dreamliner stretch or whatever those planes are going under mach 1 versus the starship super heavy booster going 30 times faster and the cost 10 million dollars versus 350 million dollars almost 30 times lower cost there. And then the fuel costs are not that different because although you need more fuel more quickly, if you go over 9,000 miles, then the, the the actual fuel use, you know, a thousand tons versus 200 tons may not be that large of a differential. And if you're using methane instead of 
uh, jet fuel, the cost per pound can be less for the for the oxygen and methane. Because uh, you can generate methane from natural gas, the oxygen you can get out of the atmosphere, you can liquefy it on site, you may have to transport it. So that goes to the cost of it. And then the payload, a, a advanced um, Raptor engine could increase the reusable payload to 200 tons versus 50 to 80 tons for the largest cargo planes. So you, you're moving more mass. Point to point travel, you're only looking at the upper stage, which is only those $1.5 million worth of engines. And you're still moving the 200 tons because I'm not going to orbit. So I'm going anywhere on Earth, you know, 9,000 miles, 10,000 miles. And then I'm going to land on another Mechazilla launch tower. That Mechazilla launch tower is a, a huge deal because that is catching things. So the point to point um, military contract that they have where the Air Force and, and Space Force are paying them $150 million to do a point to point travel. They will not be able to land on the battlefield. You know, they're not going to like deliver commandos to a battlefield. The reason is that we saw in the second SpaceX test where launching over hardened cement that it ripped up the cement because the engine was too powerful, right? So you can land like on the moon something like that, but you're using small engines because the moon's one sixth of gravity. So 136 the force on a on an engine because I can use six times less for uh, squared, you know, force times mass uh, acceleration squared. And the, if I have the engine up the top, then I'm not going to blast the, uh, the the regolith that much, I'm spread it all okay. around, right? So if I'm landing on um, a regular battlefield, I'm going to be throwing up a lot of rocks. I have to prepare a landing pad, right, so that it I can land land it safely. Better would be I travel a half half an hour to, to the wherever I'm going, fly over it, and then deploy something with parachutes or something like that that can deploy it. So I can get the commando, that can get the um, uh, cargo supplies to wherever I need to go super quick, like they the military wants. But I would have it come in on, on parachutes and gliders or whatever to to land in the site, because if I even I could land onto a prepared landing pad. If I take off, I'm I'm kind of gonna rip that up and then create a, a tornado of things, uh, you know, rocks that we did last time. So, yeah, so that's why I see that you need to go um, launch tower to launch tower, and mass producing launch towers is also something you need to do because you're gonna have the mech of the launch tower catch the booster and the starship. If I'm launching these things all the time like um, going to air cargo because things are 30 times cheaper, 30 times faster, then I'm going to go launch tower, launch tower, say um, initially three or four launch towers at the center of each continent, three or four. And then I go have, do a deal with FedEx and um, UPS, deliver the, car, the, the cargo sorted to each of the um, interior um, uh, intercontinental um, 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 space ports, and then they will go to the other continent. So then I shave off 10 hours, 12 hours of flying time to go from North America to Asia, North America to Europe, Europe to Asia. So I connect the continents, shave off those 10 hours. So then the, the package delivered becomes um, faster. And then I would then get, go city to city by making 200 more launch towers at each of the major cities, New York to London, New York to Tokyo, all the direct cities. And you have to have them, you know, the spaceport, the launch tower outside the city, you know, uh, off um, some coastal area. Again, for flight safety reasons that you wouldn't want to land inside a city. Um, so the reason that you're going to air cargo, because if I have, I math produce, thousands of starships because they have they have a 4000 engine factory that can produce 100 starships with boosters every uh, year and i'm not going to destroy them anymore i'll just make more and more so after 10 years off a thousand then for for the amount of mass so if i if i have a 100 starships 
200 tons a um, each each payload. I fly them um, four times a week, three times a week, right? Um, up from <clears throat> at, at the fastest turnaround of a Falcon 9 was like 21 days. So I, I fly them three times um, three times a week. We're looking at 100 flights per Starship every year, right? Because, you know, flights every two, three days, 100 star flights um, a year. And then if I have 100 of them, that's 10,000 flights. 10,000 flights times 200 tons, that's 2 million tons. So I've gone up from a few thousand tons a year now to 2, two million tons capacity with just the first 100 starships. So even in my dominate air communication, we'll discuss that part of my discussion. Dominate air uh, communications, the amount of things that I'm taking, if I drop that cost down to $10 per kilogram, right? Because it's just fuel costs and, and doubling that up for the amortization of the, of the engine, then I'm competitive with air cargo. A lot of air cargo is um, $3 to $7 per kilogram. If I'm at $10 per kilogram, I'm, I'm right there. And it, um, if I only use the upper stage, I can drop the cost one fifth because the upper stage is only one quarter of that cost. So it can be cheaper than that, but uh, you wouldn't go cheaper. You know, just like I, SpaceX is not giving the lowest cost right now, but I don't have enough satellites that can be mass produced, other space things that can be mass produced to justify the reusable Starship. I need to go against air cargo because that is what's moving at a million tons a year, right? So the only ma thing that matches up is air cargo, right? And then go ahead. Well, I, I was I was going to say, you know, again, this this I this is a really big idea, right? The mm -hmm. idea that you could, you know, instead of taking first class, you could take a rocket in the future. Right. Um, so a few years back, Lieutenant General Stephen Quast gave a lecture at Hillsdale College. And he cryptically mentioned at the time a new technology that can transport a human anywhere in the world in an hour. And when I interviewed him, I was wondering what that was. Essentially, he was talking about AFRL rocket cargo, which is the same thing that you were describing here, right? So this is something that has been emerging for a while. And I know for myself, when I when I really started to learn what this meant – it's just mind blowing. And it's it's not based on really fundamentally new technology, right? This isn't a warp drive or anything like that. It's just the evolution of existing tools and technologies and economies of scale that are bringing this within reach of the average person. And that's really exciting. It's uh, innovation on uh, business models and it's being willing, you know, like Elon is to drive a large company like a startup that that he had not lost the um drive it like a, a, a startup mentality even though he had a huge company he could be like bezos and create amazon which is a great thing and create cloud computing but bezos is not willing to go all in on blue origin right he's not willing to uh, risk everything to to take it to the next level, right? Yeah. He, he doesn't have, um, you know, as great as he is, you, well, he did that for, for cloud computing, where basically it was an entirely new thing and then he, he pushed the envelope on that. So that is the, the innovation aspect of things is on the audacity, the boldness to say, here's first principles what can be done and then going to be able to lead the the team and the experts to to achieve that that goal. Um, Boeing and NASA knew you needed to to go for for usability, and they had the team team there to do it. But they chose to do it in a backwards format for the space shuttle. And when they realized that they had to do one billion dollars worth of repairs nearly for every relaunch to fix the tiles, they didn't say, "Oh, the tiles are wrong. We got to." redo this thing they just went with it they just like, kept pushing forward on the bureaucracy they just just yeah. give us the money to achieve achieve the end right while elon's saying well if i do that i can still make the business but then 
I can't get to Mars. I can't do the other things I want to do, right? And so he's willing to get the uh, technology right in terms of like, I must fully reuse. I must rapidly fully reuse. So that means making a launch tower to catch things, right? And then people say, well, the launch tower, catching things, that's just crazy. How can you do that? Because they've been landing on the drone ship, the drone ship is actually 70% the size, uh, oh, sorry, larger, the, the, the catching arms of the mega the launch tower, 70% the size of the drone ship. So because they've landed 200 times on the drone ship, they know we can hit a target a little bit smaller than that. And that's that, that's the, 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 the catching arms of the launch tower. Mm, okay. So basically they're, they're just, when you look at everything that they're doing, it's like, when I need to get to the scale I want to get to, then I need to change the rest of the system around me based on these principles of rapid reuse. Because like I said, the, the landing of the Falcon 9 on drone ship, as great as it is, the fastest turnaround was 21 days. I need to get the drone ship back. I need to put this heavy 100 ton thing on a crawler. I need to, that crawler moves like one kilometer uh, an hour or something like that. You know, if we've seen the crawler before, move the, the Saturn V, move the space shuttle. Yeah. It just it's slow. You're dealing with heavy things. So you have to land back. So it's like the when you look at I'm going to achieve X, then from that A, B, and C must happen. And because they're willing to say, I will make A, B, and C happen, that's when the full leapfrog capability happens. Okay. That they're willing to take that time to do it. Well, so, Brian, I want to jump into robotics from here, and this actually keeps us with Tesla. You have been talking about AI humanoid robots, and again, big, mind-blowing change based on innovation and evolution of existing technologies. So, you've been talking about AI humanoid robots being used first to manufacture electric vehicles like Tesla, no, you know, not the factory robots that we're used to now, but actual humanoid robots, which is something that Tesla is building and developing and right. the labor being used to replace labor in other industries later on as mm -hmm. these robotic manufacturers simplify their robotic supply chain, streamline parts and drive down costs with facilities like the Gigafactory. So, you know, this is something that um, I don't have nearly the awareness on this that you do. I would love for you to explain. I, I think that we've all seen photos of humanoid robots. You know, everybody's familiar with Boston Dynamics. Tesla is also working on this. Where do you see those going? So everyone knows about uh, Tesla bot. Elon's talked about it, said how, how it's going to be used. Um, I have those pictures. And then recently uh, at the NVIDIA um, two-hour keynote speech by Jensen Wang, he had on stage nine humanoid robots. Mm. So um, those were the other companies and, and NVIDIA is going to create uh, special chips for them, a software stack. So it's easier for those companies to um, develop their, their humanoid robots. Um, Funding-wise, Several of those companies um, have over a billion dollars uh, worth of um, funds. Uh, Unitree in China has about $5 billion. They're basically China's version of Boston Dynamics, and they're publicly traded. And then Figure AI just got $650 million from a group of investors, including OpenAI and uh, Microsoft. Um, so Sam Altman has said that, you know, they need to, AI will become AGI and it needs to be embodied in robotics. Um, and so they're going to go hard at that. So I'm going to say that Tesla and Tesla bot would be the one that has this more transformational uh, capability, like, even though the other is, you know, uh, figure, uh, AI, um, agility robotics, they'll make thousands of bots. The market is huge. In this case, they will have a lot of, all companies will have a lot of success with this because they're just replacing human labor. The markets are virtually unlimited if you can find the right niches for that. But in terms of the bigger replacing labor and doing manufacturing, 
I'm going to make the case for Tesla. And I'm not just saying, oh, you're the Tesla fan, something like that. I'm saying because of this first principles, I'm willing to change everything I do in order to make this work. That's why I'm saying Tesla and Tesla bot will succeed with this. So what's different about Tesla bot? Not necessarily the robot itself, although they did make their own actuators for the hands and fingers and everything like that. And they're doing rapid development on that aspect of things. It is that they're changing their manufacturing process to go around the robot. So there's the unboxed process. I'm not sure if you've heard about that. It was that Tesla AI day, people who, mm -hmm. who don't follow all these things. So the unboxed process. So the traditional making a car is you make the frame of the car, right? You put the, the wheels on it and then people start working inside the car to, to put in the engine. It goes down the assembly line and the more and more things are added. You put on all the components, all the doors, you paint the vehicle, and then you remove the doors because you the welding joints um, have to be uh, painted all in one go. I can't like have a, um, you know, paint one part, paint another part. It'll be patchwork. It won't be smooth, right? Okay. So because of all these limitations around it, you, you're building the, the, the frame, you're putting everything into it, you're painting doors on, doors on, painting, take the doors off, finishing the work. But the unbox process is let's reinvent this entirely and make it like a giant Lego. So I make the front and the rear. They're already doing that with called Giga Casting. Are you familiar with Giga Casting? No. Oh. So okay, so um, Tesla has been reducing the parts in the vehicles for um, since, since they've been uh, starting to do this work. So they have um, they can make a thousand changes um, a week on their car on their car. So if I have one car um, in the in the factory line and in Tesla, the next car can be different. I can switch out the HVAC system different from the last one. They can do this and still maintain quality because they have a digital twin of every vehicle. So okay. they know every part on this vehicle different from the parts in that one. So they, they, they can innovate constantly. They've driven the incremental cost of innovation down to you know dollars, pennies per, per change. And all the others, I have to do an entire new model year in order to start doing some some big changes like this so and they have also something called digital self-management where each of the work groups will have say i'm gonna do some painting on it i'll scan the vehicle it'll say okay these paint things are wrong up on the screen it'll say i score it a 70 make these modifications a uh, human work crew and then we'll rescan it and then see if it passes what, what is that number, the digital self-management? That is basically an AI learning function. That is them saying, if you do this, I score 70, fix it, it goes to 90, 95, it passes at 93. That is an AI learning function. So then I can have work groups that are human. I can have work groups that's robotic. I have double, you know, five work groups on each thing. And then until the robot work group is better than the human work group, it doesn't matter. I'm just working around. Just like I have work groups of new people in the factory. So, so those are some things to understand about Tesla factories today. So then they're going to reinvent. This is the best factory process in the world, better than the Toyota process. People went and did their MBA before about the Toyota manufacturing process. The Tesla process is superior. Not Brian saying this, but CareSoft a company with like a 2,000 people that analyzes car, uh, cars and, and their factories and their processes. They tear down cars. They totally analyze the processes. They say that the best process is the Tesla process. So the unbox process is I totally remit everything. I'm making everything in like giant Legos. So then each of the major points, front, uh, left, front, right, um, back, rear, back, left, are all in separate pieces. The giga casting is something that they've been doing already where I take the front back of the car, front of the car, and then they made new alloys with SpaceX 
so that you can inject a complex mold and then within milliseconds, it will then solidify and be mm. a perfect rear of the car. So what 200 parts, 400 parts, 300 robots becomes one giant gigacathy machine for the front and the rear, right? So they it's Lego part one, Lego part two is front and rear. Lego part three is the battery pack. Okay. So they, they make that part of the structure. So these were things that they're already kind of moving towards in their process. But now they're saying every other part of it is going to also be like, so three Lego pieces, I now add in say five other Lego pieces for the car. So what is Lego pieces? How does that help? I can have this Lego piece that is, you know, the size of a dishwasher. And I can have um, four workers, one here, one here, one here, one here. So then I can increase the density of work instead of one, two guys in, in the whole car, I can have eight pieces, four people around each piece, 32 workers at the same time, working in parallel on eight pieces. And then at the end, I assemble all those pieces together and then it all works, right? So then I've gone parallel. Instead of like one thing going down the line, taking takes 10 hours for Tesla, takes 30 hours, 25 hours for Volkswagen, right? So they're ready, we're faster, two, three times faster. And now they can get eight times faster because they're all these separate pieces are being worked on separately in parallel. So what can you do? You can replace the workers with robots. So now the robot doesn't have to climb into the car. It's outside. It, it's designed for them, right? So now I can replace it with 32 robots doing everything, right? So then, and then you have all the digital self-management all ready to go. Something they had to do for that is that for the Cybertruck, they have something called the 48-volt um, architecture. Mm. So that was a huge change to go from 12-volt, which existed for like four decades, five decades. And now they're going 48-volt. Well, lighter wires, that's, that's nice. But the other thing is that the 48 volt can connect like uh, Ethernet. So then I can have the, the wiring in this module and then snap it to the next one in the, um, in the next module. So each of the, the wiring connects inside of those large pieces, those blocks, right? So you need to go to 48 volt in order to achieve unbox process, right? Okay. So oh, unbox process being giant Legos, right? And they also had to do um, drive-by wire and then need to add steer by wire. Because again, I'm not doing wiring harnesses all over the vehicle. I'm doing 48 volt and I'm gonna also carry the, um, you know, uh, communications for the, the brakes and for the steering in separate pieces. So they had to do all these changes in order to make this huge leap in capability, which will be twice as efficient as other processes. And this was again, analyzed by CareSoft. So again, not Brian saying it, not Tesla saying it, a third party analyzed it. And they're telling Chinese car makers how to copy it, which will be a few years behind, right? But the Chinese want to copy everything that they do. So, yeah, yeah. so this is, again, the next level aspect of that. So then because they're redoing the manufacturing process for bots, then they can, and also not just if I, you know, BMW gets some robots, like a working figure, I get some robots and they put them into the same process. It doesn't get faster, right? It's like, I totally reinvent it to get it two times faster. And then I'll dial up the speed even more to get 10 times faster, right? So they had to reinvent it and make new technologies, new alloys to do the gigacasting, new 48 volt architecture, change all the wiring, allow it to snap together. So they fundamentally redesigned everything. It's similar to Costco versus Walmart. Costco has $2 million per worker in terms of revenue versus, you know, like $300,000, $400,000 for, for Walmart. Costco doesn't beat them at everything because, you know, there's other issues there. But on the labor efficiency, Costco crushes its competition, right? It's because they designed their process around forklifts. Forklifts move the pallets 
and they put them there and they do not unpack, reshell the pallet. They just like slice open the, the, the covers and then people go and pick their sharpened carpet and get their stuff from there. So same thing is you invent the process for the robots because the robots are completely different, right? Um, but the humanoids, so then it's, it could be the same where it needs to be the same, right? Okay. So, so then... Tesla can go and say they have 150,000 employees in all their factories. Now they replace them half and half with robots and then eventually all with robots. And then they can go um, for each robot, three shifts, four shifts versus one human shift. They can expand faster. Initially, if they go like half and half, they can open up four new factories with their trained workers and increase the level of production. If Tesla can increase production from 400,000, 500,000 cars per quarter now to 2 million per quarter, then that's 8 million cars. That enables them to, you know, the valuation would go up like from, you know, a half trillion up to $4 trillion, right? So the economics of doing this will be huge. And of course, they will be able to sell it to all of their suppliers, Say, hey, suppliers adopt this method. I'll say, rent you some um, some bots, and then it will then spread out from there. But they'll have they're their own best customer, just like the SpaceX, Starlink is their own best customer for for Starlink launches. So then, yeah. So that's how yeah. how the launch happens. It, and again, this is absolutely absolutely amazing. I want to do a left turn here and jump into nuclear energy. This is also something that you're a big fan of. So we have talked about space so far, and there are a ton of opportunities there for nuclear. As you have said, the farther out you get from the sun, the more difficult solar is. Nuclear is the most dense power source available. So it has so many advantages. It's already used in satellites. So it's something that, you know, there's familiarity there. In terms of robotics, though, and in terms of vehicles, one of the things that we are seeing is we're building this infrastructure that is based on lithium ion batteries. And there's a lot of utility there. And there is some room for growth, right? New chemistries, new densities, things like that. But one of the things that I've wondered about is if nuclear could begin to replace, I mean, micronuclear could begin to replace lithium ion. The reason that I mention this is my friend Oscar L. Martin over on LinkedIn suggested that Tesla use the 85 kilowatt Marvel micro reactor that the DOE is developing for the Tesla semi. And at first blush, I was like, why would you do that? And I thought, you know what? If you've got a robotic rig and it can drive all the time, the last thing you want to have to do is recharge that every few hours, right? So mm -hmm. if you can start to take stuff like that and, and uh, you know, cargo boats, things along those lines, mm -hmm. put these mini reactors in them, you could have these things to operate all the time, right? What, what are your thoughts on that area? While technically correct, it, it could do that. It could technically mass produce them. Um, Regulatory-wise, society-wise, we're not there for that. I I look at a lot of uh, companies, um, you know, try to help fund them and that kind of thing. But the time to get some regulatory approval, a new reactor, time to deploy, time to um, make the math pressure happen, um, it's not going to happen in the time frames that we want. Mm. Uh, it, it can ultimately be there. It will be there for... Um, um, the later development of the solar system, it will also can grow from where it is now, from the you know nearly four hundred gigawatts that we have now at the you know ten fifteen percent of uh, global electricity, right? So it's part of that solution, but the micro reactor getting it to the level where you're making. Like if if I was to use one per semi truck, if I'm going to make twenty million semi trucks, right? I'm not going to be able to scale to twenty million reactors um, in in the proper time frame, right? Because that you know, looking to to if you're looking to make fifty thousand the year next year or the year after, th those things won't be ready, right? Okay. So um, and then the other thing is that you need to to scale the um the solar and the and the and the batteries so the 
lithium batteries are at um, one to two terawatt hours per year now, right? So the, yeah, so, so that's um, millions of, of megapacks that, you, that you'd be having having there. So the megapacks are the four um, megawatt hour ones that uh, that are shipping container they're used by utilities and that kind of stuff. So the, the math on that uh, doesn't quite uh, work out um, okay. so okay. Uh, if, if I say, if I talk about, so the, the solar and the batteries need to scale out and they will, and because they're not, you know, we're already doing it at, at a high level, increasing it from where we are now to three X, four X is easier than taking some other new technology and the scaling it like even for batteries. Um, a new battery technology is sodium ion. So that will be, that can be 10 times cheaper. It's less energy dense, but it's more about how many I'm making them than how energy dense it is. Because that can be six times cheaper on the raw materials than the um, iron lithium phosphate batteries, which are the cheaper version of lithium, two kinds, nickel lithium, which came first, and then the now the iron lithium um, batteries. So those can scale and CATL, largest battery maker in the world, is already making those into batteries for cars and for other storage. But that is at the gigawatt, a few gigawatt hour, hour level, which is several hundred times less than how much we have on the lithium ion side. So the way uh, lithium iron uh, took over to get as dominant and will soon pass lithium nickel is that they grew two to three times faster every year than the 50% growth. So this is doubling and tripling and this thing is going 50%. It's still growing, but then you have to overtake it. It's like um, replacing silicon ch chips, you know, back in the day. And we kept saying, okay, we'll come up with gallium arsenide. We'll come up with whatever. They have niche uses, which are better, but the predominant thing still stayed silicon because you have to replace a trillion dollar industry with that. Yeah. You know, the the scaling of what you need to do is what well, uh, limits the choices. So so in terms of nuclear though, I know that you are pro nuclear. What we're talking about probably is the evolution of models that we're already familiar with, right? Nuclear mm -hmm. reactors. And right. then just advances in battery technology. So again, these are things that we're already familiar with. We're just going to see them continue to evolve, right? But that right. that still puts us in the realm of robotic vehicles, robotic shipping, things along those lines. We could potentially see, like uh, one of the things that I've seen is Yamaha just came out with a really amazing, super high power four stroke engine for drones. And so that's something there's potential for too. We may see internal combustion come back for some of these long duration drones. So it's, it's um, again, something where you have to look at the whole um, business model, uh, the whole ecosystem, what you're doing, supply chain to see um, what has to happen. So it's, as you say, the, the total reusable rocket was the rocket itself, the technology itself is similar. It was just how you put it together the whole recipe that came together to achieve that. So um, determining technology winners is um, requires more than just comparing one uh, set of specs and features, you know, that, to say, okay, this would win because of that. It could be the case for a certain niche where that feature is absolutely necessary. Like going beyond um, Jupiter, right? That, when I send things out there, I really need to use nuclear because the the amount of solar as I go twice as far is dropping by, you know, fifty yeah. percent, right? So I get out to Jupiter, and the and the amount of solar is like only one percent or that. So it just the physics of that forces you to a different solution. And if I want to develop beyond, you know, those ranges beaming the power out becomes impractical like it, it's other solutions just don't start working so you, then you're left with with nuclear at, at scale um okay. around earth um it should have been developed that we should have had you know thousands of nuclear reactors that was a plan at the time of nixon 
and that should have happened, but because of oil lobby, coal lobby, um, people wrong hit on, on, on the environment, you know, made the mistakes. It's it it didn't happen, and at this point, turning that around, what we want to do, um, we don't want to hold up the future for something that's that's um, we're gonna have to work around because of how, how things have gone. That makes sense. That makes sense. Well, Brian, we have burned through some really, really big ideas today. So mm -hmm. I want to thank you for your time and close by asking what is coming up for you in the next few months and what can we expect to see on the next Big Future website? Well, I write uh, articles every day, like um, five plus articles every day, usually. And uh, I'll be doing you know more talks, uh, like I said, with the um, Asian um, business um, leaders on human robots and AI. So I think, depending on your definition, you know, some form of AGI uh, could could be happening as we get to GPT five this year. Um, Grok says it's gonna, you know, Grok two is supposedly gonna come out this week and and surpass um, some of the existing GPT four on certain metrics. We'll see if that happens. Uh, self driving cars is rapidly developing with um, FSD twelve point three point three. 12.4 should be out this this um, month, 12.5 next month. If the data on Tesla F, uh, the Tesla FSD tracker, a crowdsource um, th a site which um, accumulates uh, amount of disengagements, the amount of disengagements in 12.3 uh, was three times more uh, more miles um, between disengagements than for the best version 11. So if we get three times better on each of the next versions and each month, then it can rapidly get to full robo taxi level, which was 17,000 miles for Waymo. So just on those metrics, this could happen very quickly. Um, and then that will enable the development of the Tesla bot to, to go faster because it was using the same kind of AI as being used in self-driving. So having a full robotaxi level self-driving system still to be regulatory approved in all places would enable um, a rapid improvement of Tesla bot. So there's a lot of, and then we also mentioned that next month, that, that next launch is of SpaceX Starship. So a lot of huge developments, not all just SpaceX, also all things in science, AI, AGI. So tracking a lot of things. Amazing. Amazing. And again, I want to remind people to keep visiting nextbigfuture.com. And I want to thank you again so much for your time today, sir. Thank you.